In the original version of video 5.2 for density functional theory, there's a pretty serious error on a fundamental equation, so I took the opportunity to cut this video to make a correction. In most of the videos, my face does not appear. I'm just a disembodied voice uh, talking about the material, but having made an error, I feel like I ought to own up to it and uh, take the consequences, so I'm going to film myself as well as the content while uh, explaining how to fix the error. So let's uh, actually show the slide. It was the first slide of content in 5.2, and it goes through the various things on which H depends in the uh, density functional expression. And what I want to illustrate as an error is this formula right here. Let's just highlight that up. Uh, and it says, it's a terrible formula in many respects, it says rho, that's the electron density, is equal to n, the total number of electrons, times the integral over all space and all coordinates of the square modulus of the wave function. So first off, uh, it's a little unfortunate because rho is usually something we think of as being identified at a position in space. Right? It has units of per cubic bore, per cubic angstrom, per cubic length unit, if you will. And uh, it is by integrating over space that we get some value number of electrons, for example. And so it's not really clear what to make of rho without an argument, necessarily. It could be shorthand, but it seems kind of bad shorthand in that case. Moreover, what is the integral of the square modulus of the wave function over all its coordinates over all space? Well, that would be 1 as long as the uh, wave function is normalized. And so what that formula seems to say is rho is equal to the total number of electrons, which is not a terribly informative equation in any case. Uh, the next one down, as you see, says that the total number of electrons is equal to the integral of the density over all space. That is correct. But what went on here? Uh, what was I thinking when I put in this bad formula? Well, I'll just uh, talk about various formulae that could have been used instead. So here's the incorrect formula, which doesn't even really specify a spatial position. In the textbook, I actually do have a correct formula, which is sort of a relief. But uh, it's this one. It says that the electron density at a given position in space, capital, uh, sorry, boldface R, is going to be a sum over the occupied orbitals, square modulus of the orbitals evaluated at that position in space. So there's nothing wrong with that formula, but I was trying to do some value added, essentially, in the lecture. And one of the features of the formula that's a, a little dissatisfying in some respects is that it invokes a Slater determinantal wave function. That is, it, it implicitly imagines you have constructed your wave function out of one electron orbitals in kind of the classic way we build up molecular orbital theory. But there ought to be a way to do this definition for sort of a generic wave function. There's, there's no restriction that a wave function be a Slater determinant. A Slater determinant is simply a convenient way to ensure that a wave function is anti-symmetric. That is, when you swap the coordinates of any two particles, it changes sign. But you can write other functions that way, too. So if you actually look at a generic way to write a wave function properly, you would define something called the one-electron reduced density matrix. And it... The term matrix here is used a little bit loosely. It's sort of a continuous function in two variables, this thing gamma. Uh, but it does have two variables that index it, much as a matrix has two variables that index it. And so uh, the indices are positions in space, x and x prime. And it looks a little like the formula in red up here in the sense that it's an integral over all but one of the electronic coordinates. And I've replaced then x1 that would otherwise have appeared here with x and x prime. So those are the two positions where we want to evaluate a value for gamma. And then we integrate over all the other positions. And if it seems as though that is somehow calling out uh, x1 as being special, and maybe I should have put an index on here of gamma 1, that's actually not required. Remember that the wave function, even if, even if we think about a Slater determinant, the wave function is composed of indistinguishable part particles. So 
saying that you're doing it for electron one can't give you anything different than doing it for electron two or electron three. So if we do think about Slater determinants, a fallacy in the way we sometimes think about these things is that we usually only think about the first term in the Slater determinant. That is, we've put an electron that we call one into orbital one and an electron we call two into orbital two. But in fact, the real Slater determinant considers all possible permutations of those labeled electrons into the labeled orbitals in order that it is indistinguishable and it is not important which one we call out. So it's arbitrary that I've written X and X prime here. I could have put it anywhere in here. These labels do not really mean anything per se. But we do integrate over all coordinates but one. So what is it about this one electron reduced density matrix that somehow plays a role. It does look a bit like that formula, but we haven't got anything involving rho on one side. Well, what we're interested in is when the two positions in space, x and x prime, are the same position. Call it boldface r again. So in that case, I'll put in an r here and an r here. So I integrate over all the other variables, and now I multiply times the number of electrons, because no electron is privileged. So I'm doing this for one electron, but there are n of them, and hence I multiply times n. And so now you see this actually looks a, a reasonable amount like this. This square modulus was in here because this is a square modulus, actually. Incidentally, if these were to be uh, wave functions that could be complex, this should be the complex conjugate on the left side in these two equations. But if we use real wave functions, this is fine. Uh, so it was close, but no cigar. Uh, I'll make one last point, perhaps, to uh, emphasize why people like to think about it this way, this sort of generic wave function. What would be lovely would be if, from a density, so density is something we can measure in space in principle. X-ray crystallography gives you electron density, after all. Uh, if we could extract from that density the correct wave function. So that's kind of working backwards. This equation tells you how, given a wave function, how do I get the density? What would be wonderful would be to have a density and get the wave function. Why? Well, because there's things we can do with wave functions that we can't do with densities. For instance, we could evaluate the expectation value of the total spin operator, S squared, and determine what spin state is it. Uh, we don't really have a means to talk about spin contamination or spin states easily in density functional theory because you can't apply that operator to the cone sham determinant and ex expect that it necessarily corresponds to the correct wave function. So I'll remind you that the cone sham determinant, as we'll talk about in further lectures if you're viewing this erratum right after the lecture itself, uh, is for non-interacting electrons. So it's a valid wave function, but for a fictitious system of non-interacting electrons. So were you able to extract out the wave function, it would be great. Nobody knows how to do that yet. It does turn out that there's something uh, called the n-representability problem that has to do with if I give you what looks like a nice density, smooth, continuous, cusps at nuclei, can you actually reconstruct that density as a Slater determinant? And incidentally, you can also ask about v-representability. Is there a potential that would give that, uh, that density? So these are sort of deep problems in density functional theory that people worry about. They're beyond the scope of this course, but they are uh, often associated with this quest, if you will, to extract the wave function out of the density, which remains an unsolved problem. All right, well, that's enough for this erratum. Uh, I apologize for making the mistake and hope this corrects it in a reasonably sensible way.